Welcome to this podcast review for February 25th, 2024, and I'm J.D. Duran. And I'm Brennan Cassidy. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody, for this Mm -hmm. conversation where we're going to be talking about a movie from one of the Coen brothers. A half Coen. A half Coen. (laughs) A half of a Coen has a movie out in 2024. That's always exciting. Oh, this is going to be an interesting conversation because they've both done this now. They've both tried their hands at directing on their own. Yes, they have. Joel had his movie a few years ago now, I I want to say. Yeah, that was 2021, I think. I'm going to double check that. The Tragedy of Macbeth was 2021. Yes, that's correct. 2021. 2021. And here we are with Ethan Cohen and his new movie, Drive Away Dolls, a movie that has been in the making for like 30 years literally <laughs> was it really that long i want to say so like it was started i believe in the mid 90s and okay. it was something that they tried to put together in the early 2000s it did not work out okay and obviously it kept getting delayed and pushed back and they just couldn't find the time or uh, you know, the they didn't have the resources to put everything together. Yeah. Until now, until 2024. So. They being the Cohen brothers, was this something that the Cohens were working on or something? And then no, it just this is this is something that Ethan has been cooking up, if you will. Okay. With his okay. wife Tricia Cook. Okay. I see what you did there. I see what you Appreciate did there. It. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They've been working on this for a while. Um, and, and as I noted, they, they tried to get this in development in the early two thousands. The idea mm-hmm. I want to say I read again was first thought of or provoked, talked about in the mid nineties, mm-hmm. but it was in the early two thousands when they first started to pursue developing it for real. Okay. And it was announced in January of 2007 that, they were going to try to get Allison Anders to direct the film under the title Drive Away Dykes. Okay. Of course, this film does allude to at the end of the film. Yeah, sort of reveals that that may have been the cryptic title all along. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, But unfortunately, it did not come to fruition in the early 2000s, of course. Mm -hmm. Here we are in 2024 I, I believe going back to april of 2022 is when it really started to go into production mm-hmm. and and then the film was supposed to come out last year but was delayed due to the sag strikes so now it is dumped in february <laughs> <laughs> dumping <laughs> ground that's unfortunate it does make sense that it's now that we're finally getting this film. If Ethan Cohen and Trisha Cook were going to have involvement in it, and it was going to happen when both Joel and Ethan de- decided to try their hands at making movies on their own for a moment, because yeah. this this movie is, as we'll talk about, very much an Ethan Cohen movie. Yes, uh, and, and not not to say that he has a certain flair within the Cohen brothers' filmography that's more noticeably him. It's more personal than that. I, I mean, I think we can. I think we could hypothesize that, given the film that we got here. Um, but it's certainly more personal than that, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah, it is very personal. That is for yeah. sure. And I think what's interesting is that we've always talked about the Cohen brothers as a pair, as a duo, right? And here we are with Ethan Cohen working with his wife Trisha Cook. Mm-hmm. And I think noticeably, this is also a movie coming from a pair. Yeah, it, it is. is no secret that while they are married, they have separate partners. Trisha mm-hmm. Cook has come out uh, and is living a gay lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, separate from Ethan, even though they are married. So that's an interesting development in their relationship. And 
it's part of why they wanted to do this movie specifically together. It is. So. It's it's very much challenging the notion of what a spouse ultimately is by definition, mm-hmm. and I think that's really fascinating. I have this headline up here from People where um, it's basically talking about the uh, marriage between Ethan Cohen and Trisha Cook and how non-traditional that it is, and apparently Ethan is quoted by saying something like, she's queer and sweet, and I'm straight and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I just found that fascinating, but I but it does make sense that this is a movie that's more or less trying to maybe not address, but sort of represent the interesting marriage that they have, uh, and, and and sort of get us to talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. So I I very much look forward to diving into. Mm -hmm. This film, and there is certainly going to be a lot to talk about regarding the film on its own terms, Mm -hmm. but in many ways, it will be impossible to separate it from the Cohen brothers, Joel and Ethan. I think there's so much to talk about with this film, even within the lens of the Coens and their filmography together. Yeah. So I'm sure that will be a big part of this as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, So let's go ahead and dive into it. It is titled Drive Away Dolls, uh, directed by Ethan Cohen, written by, of course, Ethan and Trisha Cook. It stars Margaret Qualley, Geraldine Viswanathan, Beanie Feldstein, Coleman Domingo, Pedro Pascal, Bill Camp. Oh, yeah. Curly. Plain Curly. The master of all cameos. You know, I debated whether or not to reveal this here, but Brendan is pretty adamant that he's in the trailer. He is on the poster. His name and, is at least on the poster. Uh, and it, it, it does say his name uh, on the main poster with the entire cast. Okay, so there you go. It also has an appearance by the one and the only Matt Damon. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't surprise me. Matt Damon is the one actor in Hollywood where if you just need a cameo from a big star... He's going to be the one to do it. He's, he's kind of your go to so times. He's just yeah. the go to for it. Yeah. I'm and trying to think it. how far this stretched back because I remember seeing him pop up in Christopher Nolan's Interstellar. And which, which, which that was a shock already. But I, I feel like this occurrence has been happening even before that. Oh, <laughs> for sure. No, it yeah. has to go back to what was the movie? Oh, God, I'm drawing a blank here. The movie where he's the singer at the beginning of the film, Johnny doesn't know. Oh, oh, what was that? What it, what am I thinking of? Uh, my, I'm drawing a blank here. We'll have to figure this out mid conversation. Someone's but, gonna have to look this up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. That I think movie, I do. Yeah, yeah. Where he pops up at an uh, Euro trip, right? Is the name? Oh, of that film. that's it. Okay, it's Euro trip. It's the beginning of the film. Here comes Matt Damon on stage, you know, dressed as this goth singer of sorts. What a good sport. And proceeds to sing the song Johnny Doesn't Know. What a good sport. And, you know, in the small little indie comedy, or it might not have been indie, but it's the small little comedy movie. Yeah. That, you know, ended up becoming this cult hit of sorts. That moment in particular has absolutely become a, a cult scene at the well, very least. At the very least, yeah. I wonder if that film has cult status primarily because of Matt Damon. And it could be because yeah. honestly, I don't remember much beyond that moment in that movie. <laughs> that's the moment anyone talks about. Like of all well, these surprise cameos, no wonder the makers of that of film <laughs> fought for a cameo like that, so that the that way the movie had some type of staying yeah. power. And I can't recall the details. He's talked about that on a podcast before. Oh, where yeah. Where he was off shooting, I think, one of the Bourne movies, had some time off, but knew a producer or maybe the director of that film. I can't really recall. Mm-hmm. But he had a day. They were shooting nearby each other or something to that degree. And mm-hmm. he's like, Will you do this cameo? And he's like, Sure. Sounds like a lot of fun. And so he went and <laughs> did that cameo. And the bright size, like he, 10 he, minutes. he probably wasn't even paid for it. <laughs> probably not. So. 
<laughs> I mean, the, this goes way back for Matt Damon. And that film, because yeah. that film came out in what, like 2004, I think? Something like that, early to mid 2000s. Yeah. So this goes back years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for Matt Damon. Oh, Matt Damon. What a good sport. What an yeah. interesting character. I'd love to grab like, a beer with yeah. him. Interstellar is another good one, though, too. Like, no yeah. one knew that he was in that one. For, for and real. There's, yeah. of course, his fun pop ups in, like, the MCU, for example. Oh, so yeah. Just, as as does, actor Loki. Actor Loki. <laughs> he just does this. This is his thing. He loves yeah. the, the pop in cameo. So I guess it's never a spoiler to say Matt Damon's going to be a cameo in something, yeah. right? Yeah. The moral of the story is just expect Matt Damon to be in every movie because he might be. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> okay. it's, it's Matt Damon and Nicolas Cage in every movie ever made. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if you're not familiar with this film, it is about Jamie, who regrets breaking up with her girlfriend, while Marion, she needs to relax mm-hmm. in search of a fresh start. They embark on an unexpected road trip to Tallahassee, Florida. Things quickly go awry when they cross paths with a group of inept criminals if that doesn't sound like a Cohen synopsis, I don't know what does. I know, yeah. This is basically what queer blood simple in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little Fargo mixed in there. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of that. Yeah, a- absolutely. So I'm very excited to 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 get into this. Where should we start? Should we just give our opening thoughts on the film or should we talk about the Joe and or the Joe and the the Ethan and Joel of it all? I think we should talk about the Ethan and Joel of it all because I do okay. think that sort of plays into maybe how I feel about the movie. I'm not sure if that's the same case for you, JD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think you make a great point that talking about this film as well as the tragedy of Macbeth as Coen Brothers experiences, I think is still appropriate, which is why when we get to our Coen Brothers consensus ranking that we just finished on episode what 573, I think it was, mm-hmm. which we'll do a a quick part two of on this week's main show uh, as we see this film and try to consider it with it. I think it is fair mm-hmm. to consider movies like drive away dolls and the tragedy of Macbeth within a Coen brothers ranking because mm-hmm. they feel like these one-off exper- experiments to show us which brother is more, I guess like present in what type of tone and what type of thing overall. Yeah. Uh, and, and we sort of saw that with the tragedy of Macbeth, which while still had, a, a sort of a quirkiness to it was still a bit self serious in many ways yeah. and ha- it had a very like, like kind of like, like dreadful kind of tone. Um, mm-hmm. So that was there, which means of course, Ethan directing his own film is going to be the complete opposite of that. <laughs> Just a, a pure romp. <laughs> it is. Yeah. The, so, so it's, so it's, I guess it's fair to say that Ethan's the funny one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, I did read a story where in college he, tried to get out of an exam or some sort of essay that Mm -hmm. he didn't want to participate in by trying to argue with the teacher that a a bear ate off his arms. (laughs) So that's the kind of personality (laughs) we're dealing with here. While Joel is the film student guy, he's the one with all the craft and technical background. (laughs) Well, yeah, which is why, and it's not surprising, even though they've shared duties in many ways, the early Coen Brothers films, it was mostly Joel as the sole credited director uh, with Ethan as producer and then them both sharing screenwriting credits. Mm -hmm. Uh, I forget what film it first was where both Joel and Ethan were equally credited as filmmakers, but there was this acknowledgement that they've always been a pair. You know, they've always done all of these efforts together. It's just Joel has more of, you know, that filmmaking control. Right. Yes. He's more methodical. And that certainly makes yes. sense when you compare this film with the tragedy of Macbeth. Exactly. You understand yeah. the technical precision with Joel and his background more. And that comes through vividly in the tragedy mm-hmm. of Macbeth. I mean, from a technical perspective, regardless yeah. of how you feel about that film, it's it's a well directed movie. Yeah, it's it is m- extremely well directed. It's made by someone that knows how to make movies. Uh, yes. Uh, and drive away dolls. Yeah. It may have needed a Joel Cohen mind to really pull it together. Uh, it's, yeah. it, 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 this is a movie. I certainly appreciate more as a form of catharsis for both Ethan and Trisha to sort of create a story that 
kind of weirdly exemplifies their relationship. Mm -hmm. I like the movie more on those merits, but that doesn't necessarily mean I think it's a good movie. Uh, I, I think there's there, there, there are a lot of amusing parts here. I think this film really works as a very short, under 90 minute exploration yeah. of really just the funny side of Ethan Cohen and how he wanted to tell this story to represent the quirky side of his relationship and his marriage. Uh, and, and I think on those merits, I respect the film more uh, as that form of, I guess, statement. Uh, I do think it really lacks the control that makes the Coen brothers so great together. Uh, it's, it, it's a movie where its sense of humor and its quirkiness, it's dialed so much to the point of, like it, it, this movie is loud at how desperate it is to be as comedically on the nose as it is. Sure. Uh, it's it, it's it it's it's to the point that it gets kind of numbing after a little while. Even at yeah. eighty six minutes, I think the film is. I did find the experience a little bit numbing, even though I do like a lot of these actors, and I actually really like the chemistry here between Margaret Qualley and Geraldine Viswanathan. I think mm -hmm. they're really good together. I think some of the quieter moments are when this actually feels more like a movie than it does a series of uh, jokes and sketches in some ways. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about what the film may be trying to suggest uh, socially and politically outside of just Ethan and Trisha's marriage. Uh, but I do think if we look at this as still within the Coen brothers pantheon, I do think it's lesser. I, I just, I don't think it quite has the same level of control as some of their other films, especially when they're working together. Yeah. No, I, I think what's been fascinating about these two movies is that it's very clear, very, very clear that Joel exercises precision, understands yeah. the craft. He knows how to make a movie. Yeah. If you need cinematography, He's your guy. Incredible editor, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. He knows composition and framing and blocking. Yeah. He's a great craftsman and a great storyteller as yeah. well. But he's tonally going to be more of the nihilistic of the two, maybe mm -hmm. the most cynical of the two. Yeah. Ethan wants to make capers. <laughs> like he just wants to make a romp. <laughs> A comedy, and he wants to goof off. <laughs> okay, <Yeah. laughs> and I think that is vividly clear after these last two. But that's yeah, what makes them brilliant together. Yeah, when you think about their movies, you think about something like Fargo. That is the those two things combined quintessentially. Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's quirky. There is a rottenness to that film at times, but it is incredibly well shot. Uh, the craft is very much there, and there's mm -hmm. also a seriousness yeah. to it as well. Inside Lewin Davis could fall under that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of their films just feel like that perfect balance. Now, some of them might lean more on the extreme than others. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. And I think it's ironic that perhaps some of my least favorite Coen Brothers films, if I want to use the word least favorite because I like pretty much all, or at least most of their movies, but I find myself favoring the ones where i feel like joel's input is more present uh because mm -hmm. a movie like the lady killers for instance is probably one that's most tonally comparable to something like drive away dolls in that messiness maybe yeah. even something like hudsucker proxy and just the manic energy of it yeah i feel like maybe it, it's in those films where maybe you see a little bit more of ethan cohen's influence as a quote-unquote filmmaker coming through a mm -hmm. bit more uh and and, and i just I, I just don't think he's able to leverage that same methodical control that Joel has. Uh, and, and that's certainly evident here as well. For sure. And, and again, that's what makes them a great balancing act. What yeah. makes them great as, you know, and I'm sure some of it is their own brotherhood, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. as artists, they come at their movies from these very, these two very different angles. Yeah. And they're, they're able to find this impeccable, Middle ground, and and I agree with you. I mean, when when things get a little bit looser, those tend to be my least favorite films. Mm -hmm. You know, such as The Lady Killers, Hudsucker Proxy, Intolerable Cruelty, and I know you're not a big fan of Burn After Reading, and I might mm -hmm. like it more than you do, but I do agree that's much it definitely fits film. more in that spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. The two films where you might sense Ethan's 
leanings come to the surface a little bit heavier than mm -hmm. Joel. The, the the two movies that come to mind for me are Raising Arizona, which I think is really great, mm -hmm. and Hail Caesar, which I think is one of the best films yeah. of its you year know, as well. I might even say, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou is definitely... Oh Brother, yeah. Yeah, which if, and if true. that is yeah. the case, that is certainly my favorite of, I guess, the ones where Ethan's sensibilities might be more present. And I, I want to I yeah. emphasize that word might because we're kind of hypothesizing here uh, yeah. just based on movies like Macbeth and Drive-Away Dolls where it's easy to assume who of the two of them has a certain yeah. level of tonal control and what they want to bring to their films. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do think Oh Brother does maybe have a little bit of that mm -hmm. Ethan Cohenism that we think we're latching on to, but that yeah. one does it so well. Uh, and yeah. again, that might be the brotherhood there just really bringing it all together. Absolutely. And Oh Brother has maybe those Ethan sensibilities, but mm -hmm. you think about the craft and how that film is put together, how it's shot. That might be it's, the best looking Coen so Brothers good. film. <laughs> it's certainly distinct. There's yeah. certainly no doubt about that. And or even like Inside Lewin Davis, I think, is like an impeccable middle ground tonally. That film is quite yeah. funny at times, maybe mm -hmm. a little loose uh, with some of its character work, but it's also very controlled. The cinematography is out of bounds. Yeah. The music and the craft in their films are just you know incredible. So like together they make you know, just these wonderful movies that have a mm -hmm. great cinematic balance. Yeah. And then separately, as much as I love the tragedy of Macbeth, it's incredibly well shot. It's all of those mm -hmm. things we talked about before. Is it a little rigid and a little stiff? Absolutely. Comparatively to a Coen Brothers movie, it is. Yeah. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean it's bad, but you very much do sense Ethan missing in that movie. Yeah. And, you know, that's a great point. Uh, it makes me kind of secretly wish that if Joel was going to make a movie on his own, it wasn't a Shakespeare adaptation like that. Mm -hmm. Like I would have maybe wanted to see, didn't have to be an original story, but something that wasn't so, I guess, directly tied to an existing story. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and not to say that Shakespeare stories are rigid or anything like that, but uh, yeah, like, some of them are very much not. <laughs> some of them are very much not. Macbeth is not a rigid story, um, but it's told in kind of a rigid way because it feels yeah. very much like it's like it, like its goal is to retain Shakespeare's language as much as possible. Um, yeah. So it definitely feels more like a stage play more than anything else. But yeah, you're right. It does sort of lack, and not in a bad way. It just factually lacks that other side of the Coen Brothers brotherhood, you know, the Ethan yeah. side of things to make things a little looser a little sillier a little uh, a little more manic exactly. and, and 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 it doesn't have that and the film works because it doesn't have it but you do sometimes miss it at the same time i agree because it's there i shouldn't say there obviously yeah. for joel it's his most dramatically influenced movie since no country for old men fair yeah and not to say that's what he prefers but maybe there is Again, based off the evidence, it might seem mm -hmm. that's more of his sensibility, his leanings mm -hmm. is that versus Ethan's yeah. goofball quirking. Yeah, no, and, and, and to be fair, there are still some comedic bits of a sort in the tragedy of Macbeth. They're just not as loose and as obvious as yeah. maybe what you think Ethan would bring based on a yeah. movie like Drive Away Dolls. Like, like there's yeah. a lot that, what's her name, Catherine Hunter? is doing in Macbeth that's so out of the ordinary that it's actually kind of funny at times, but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have that usual flair for humor that we come to expect with the Coen brothers that we might get if Ethan were also by his side. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's fair to say, again, based off of what we know about them historically, not just the last two films, but historically, and mm -hmm. then you include their s separate solo efforts if they both approached that material and said, hey, we're going to do the same movie, but yeah. use our do it our own distinct ways, you get the tragedy of Macbeth as it is. Again, a little rigid and stiff. Yeah. Still great, though. Great movie. Ethan's version of that probably would have been very farcical <laughs> and satirical <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. and an overt comedy. There's just yeah. no doubt about it. Like that's just his sensibilities. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's fine. That's what makes them a great 
combo. So yeah, when you get to drive away dolls, the craft and that precision and control that you're talking about with Joel is very much missing here. Yeah, it is an underbaked movie. It comes in at 84 minutes, mm-hmm. and here's where I'll push back against some because I've seen some reviews out there claim that this is a movie that's trying to imitate the Coens. No, nah, it's nah. less of a Coen Brothers movie, and it's more so someone trying to impersonate the Coens. I would push back against that and simply say I do think this is very much half of a Cohen movie. Mm-hmm. I think the Ethan of it all, for all the reasons we just talked about, it is very much there. Mm-hmm. I, and I did have fun with the film as a result of that. Okay. It's very loose. It's casual. There's almost this aura to the film where it doesn't care about how unimportant it is. Mm-hmm. Like dumping this in February almost feels in line with the movie's ethos. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it's you know, like point. it doesn't care to be this Oscar y, we have to be in the award season as most Cohen brothers tend to be, including mm-hmm. the tragedy of Macbeth. A lot of them are up mm-hmm. for Oscars. This has more of a psychedelic free spirit that wants to take any sort of uptight or originist that could come with not just the Coen brothers movies, but any movie. And it just wants to loosen that and yeah. have some fun. And we're going to throw in some political nuances. We're going to throw in some statements against cynicism. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and in that there's a lot of Cohen to be had. Yeah. But it also just wants to be very out. It's, it's, it's a, an incredible, movie from a lesbian perspective mm-hmm. it embraces that it has a lot of fun with that i agree with you the the central performances here are very good um really enjoyed margaret qualley and geraldine uh vis swanathan uh their chemistry was was fantastic and honestly mm-hmm. I I think they carry this film in a way that uh, at least for me was more than enjoyable. So while it it lacks yeah. it lacks control, it lacks any sort of uh I guess jointedness that would make a movie a movie. This is <laughs> less of a a conventional movie and it's more so a road trip kind of gone awry and let's just have some fun and make out in the basement and that's all it cares to do. And there's something about that looseness that I kind of enjoyed here. Yeah. I I see what you're saying. And I mostly would have enjoyed it more. I guess if we got more of that time spent with our two leads, but we also get a lot of stuff with these goons and the chief played by Coleman Domingo. Uh, I, I, I like Coleman Domingo enough here, but some of the stuff with these, they're they're called the goons here. Uh, Arliss mm-hmm. and Flint, I think their names are, played by Joey Slotnick and C.J. Wilson. I believe that's that, that's who plays these two. We also got a lot of stuff with them that I just found painfully unfunny. Uh, and, and maybe that's where someone like a Joel Cohen to kind of pull the reins a little bit to, you know, really say, okay, here's what's actually working. You can't just have these two characters screaming in the background for what feels like five straight minutes. You got to pull that back just a little bit uh, because then it just kind of repeats the joke a little bit. Um, but at the same time, when it's when it is just our two lead ladies, there is kind of a hangouty nature to it, even despite the caper plot. And it's in those moments that I thought, OK, like I'm actually kind of enjoying this. And I like seeing this as an experiment of what half a Cohen is able to bring to this like we saw with Macbeth and how different that it feels. Um, mm. So in, in those moments, I do agree. It's, it, it's, it's where the looseness really feels justified. Uh, but I, I just, I don't know if I felt enough of that, if I'm being honest. Okay. I mean, I don't know how the film can get any more loose than it already is without it completely falling apart at the same. I guess it's I guess it's what aspects of that looseness I was able to latch on to versus others. And uh, that's and, certainly fair. I think that's yeah. where the conversation for this film will come down to because yeah. this as a film, if unless you're going to make it into vignettes 
into the short little films that mm-hmm. act separate and you know like uh like any sort of vignette movie you could certainly mm-hmm. do that mm-hmm. but this is about as loose as it gets if you're going to have uh yeah. A, a yeah. story around two characters yeah um and it veers off it's very meandering and there's something about the fun injected into this film that dichotomy of one of them being this free spirit and the other being really uptight and looking for love and I love that how stuff. that yeah. comes together in this film I think is is really great. Again, very loose, but there's enough control over that here. Absolutely. Especially with the performances. Absolutely. Where I, I very much didn't enjoy it. Where you and I might disagree a little bit is with the goon characters. Mm, Not okay. that their humor is laugh out loud funny. I agree. I don't think their humor is going to evoke belly laughter here. It's certainly not. But what I find interesting is that they carry the facade, this a similar f- facade of the goons you see in something like Fargo, for example. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's a play on that. It's in certainly some ways. a play on that. And at the same time, I do think this film... You know, it's I I think there's a little bit of the Big Lebowski here in the sense. That oh, I mean, I mean, yeah, this <laughs> you called this movie psychedelic. This is like taking the dream sequences from the Big Lebowski and stretching it to 60 minutes. Yes, absolutely. This is a little <laughs> bit of Lebowski in the sense that, as we talked about on, on the main show last week, on the surface, there's a lot of fleeting chaos and lunacy mm-hmm. to be had. But underneath, and I talked about this a lot on episode 573 last week, underneath all of the chaos of The Big Lebowski, I think there's some incredible thematic bite Mm -hmm. as it relates to the 90s and those kind of movies. The evolution of the 90s in particular, I think is fascinating. And I think the same thing is going on here to a much lesser degree, but in the same thing, in the same sense that on the surface is this uh-huh. chaos it's yeah. this caper but underneath i do think there's still some bite i do think this is some not that the commentary is the main point it's certainly not but no, i do think no but it is there, there. there there's an attempt it's, there for sure absolutely as far as um you know making a statement against the purification of sex and art mm-hmm. it's a movie that is pushing back against nihilism and cynicism and I think to me, that's what's really fascinating about the goon characters here because they are, are given dialogue. The film dedicates some screen time to them that you don't get in a some in something like Fargo. Not in the same way anyway. No. They they where, do kind of have their arcs in a way, which yeah. yeah. Like if I can finish that point real fast, I think yeah. what's interesting about those characters is that they're Again, on the surface, they're chasing these two girls. That's all they're doing. Mm -hmm. But getting from A to Z, uh, most of their banter is dedicated to having these discussions about what's important in life. Yeah. Like what matters to them, like how you enjoy life, which I think is an interesting subversion. To I agree. I agree. Those kind of characters you see in movies. Agreed. Yeah. Um, or I think of even something like the Bill Camp character here. There's a funny line where <laughs> he's just laying on the ground and he's like, why can't anyone save me? Like, because love those that. kind of I characters are often forgotten in these yeah. movies. You know, they I get love beat that. up and then you completely move on from them. You never see them again. So like coming back to that is this interesting pushback against cynicism within a caper that you normally don't see. So I do think they offer some value here. Now, does it reach the heights that it's going for? I don't know. But at the same time, I don't think the film is aiming for anything grand either. I think it just, it simply introduces those ideas. It has some fun with them for sure. And it brings a nuance and a heft that again illustrates that at the very least this is half of a Cohen Brothers movie. Yeah. Is it underbaked? Sure. Yeah. I, I, I do agree. It's it's underbaked. It's very loose and maybe it does need a little bit of that 
Joel Cohen precision here to, uh-huh. to restrain itself at times. But the unpolishedness of it is what I find interesting. And for Ethan Cohen to still throw in all these Cohenisms makes it, I think, more entertaining and more valuable than if this was directed by well, someone else that's well, not and, Ethan Cohen. And I like that it exists in that way. And I like that each of these characters kind of bring a almost deconstruct a deconstructive energy to what those ideas are. There's almost like a deconstruction the deconstructionist approach happening here from Ethan's point of view as a filmmaker tackling mm-hmm. these kind of tropes we see in these movies. And I do agree, it doesn't need to be anything more than what it's going for on the surface to make that point. In fact, it doesn't even need to be tightened up. But with regard to the goons, you just got to make me laugh. And I didn't. And that's the, that's the problem. For me, it's a performance thing. I don't think these actors are good at all at selling what they're trying to do. Unlike someone like Bill Camp, in that one scene you mentioned, he sells it. He absolutely mm-hmm. sells it. In some of those moments with Coleman Domingo, who barely even speaks in this movie, I think he sells it. Matt Damon shows up. He sells it. Pedro Pascal's in this movie for literally three minutes. He sells it. Those two goons do not sell it at all for me. And I, I, they, they, they're trying too hard. That, that's my problem with it is I think they're trying too hard. And so yeah. for me, it's more of a performance thing. Uh, but I like the idea of what you're talking about because it does sort of add a certain, a, a certain point of view that we don't normally get here. And I like the sort of um contemplative energy that ultimately means kind of nothing which from a plotting standpoint i like the way the arcs of those two goons crystallize like i like the idea of that i think that's actually mm-hmm. really clever uh, i just i don't like those actors in these roles i just don't think they're very good here yeah and i do think that's where when we're talking about performance and i mm-hmm. i i am able to separate the two i do agree okay. with you that the performances aren't great Mm -hmm. But there's something about how goofy they are that I do. I still think fits the film tonally. It might undermine those ideas and Mm. any sort of texture that Ethan Cohen is trying to bring to it. But at the same time, that's why I argue maybe hypocritically, I'm willing to admit, but (laughs) I would argue, I don't know if it's trying to ant, add any sort of verboseness to it. I, I I just I think it's something Ethan Cohen throws in there as this slick subversion, but it's not trying to be anything more than that. And it's just trying to have well, a lot of fun. And the performances there there's something about how goofy they are that I don't know. It just I don't know. It's like it worked for the me, thing is, though. I'm not even sure if they were goofy enough for me. I think they needed to. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe they needed to heighten it a little bit more. Uh, like like because every time it came back to these goons, and I didn't. I did not expect us to spend so much time on the goons of this movie, who barely have any importance here whatsoever. But like, I disagree. The, I I think they actually do. Well, what, whatever type of important. What, but. When I say importance, I mean comparatively to the two female leads. Or like, like Comparatively, it's a very different type of importance. But when it comes to the overall energy of this film, it and I'm, I'm for those watching on YouTube, you can kind of see what I'm doing with my hand. But every time it cut to them, it just dipped for me. Like, like it felt mm-hmm. like the film just went on. I don't want to say autopilot. It just it it, it I don't. It's hard to explain. But the film had this manic energy, and it lost that for me every time the goons were front and center. I do agree. I do agree that our central characters of Jamie and Marion are mm-hmm. much more compelling. Yeah. I'm not trying to say that they add equal value. I'm just simply saying the film did not dip for me because again, I liked the slickness of what Ethan was doing with those two characters, especially the dialogue they are given and how they're talking about life and what happiness means. I love the writing. I love the writing. Very few times do you see that in movies with those kinds of characters. And in the middle of this romp, there's something about it that did add something to it for me. Maybe. And that's fair. It it, it sounds, yeah. And and if I were able to, you know, latch onto the idea of it and just the overall, like I guess gimmick of it, I think I would be okay. It's for me, it's strictly the presentation uh, because I I like the idea of it. I like the writing. I love the dialogue. The dialogue between those two characters, I love. Uh, it mm-hmm. just it comes down to the two people trying to sell it. 
I will say where it does lose me is how it all crystallizes. Oh, I love I think, that. <laughs> you know, to me, that is where the film undermines itself because I do okay. think most of their conversation, because the dialogue they are given is all about pushing back against this type of nihilism or cynicism you see in these kind of films. And especially with those kind of characters where they're never mm -hmm. given opportunities to talk about life and what it means for them. So that, that to me is what I latched onto those characters, especially because the presentation mm. to your point isn't the greatest. They're not giving Oscar worthy performances here, even inside this goofy comedy their their performances are are the weakest element of it. I don't disagree with that, but I yeah. do love what Ethan is doing with those characters. But Same. the way he crystallizes them plays into that nihilism. And I kind of like the sleight of hand <laughs> for a film that is trying to act against that type. I don't know if that makes any sense. Now, given the peril that. Jamie and Marion are in, I understand that there needs to be a way to pull the rug out there for them to escape said peril. So convenient, so but contrived. I, I don't know if that's the way to do it, given how you set those two characters up. But, um, you know, it leads to an mm -hmm. ending that certainly has some levity mm -hmm. that I did enjoy because of the Matt David cameo. Yeah. And also the Beanie Feldstein of it all, which we haven't talked about. Oh, yeah, she's good yet. here. And so she's like, good here. It leads to this ending that is very hopeful and fun and compassionate, uh, which is ultimately what the film is trying to go for. Yeah. So I understand why Ethan and Trisha make the choices they do with the goon characters there. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword to crystallize them that, that way because... I do think it almost. Oh, it makes it seem like it was a waste of time. It makes it, it makes it makes it seem like it was a waste of time, even spending time with them in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. And in a weird way, it's kind of like Ethan saying, "Yeah, we're gonna do this," and I actually don't care about them. So now we're gonna also do this. It, it's like Ethan getting in his own way, which is, I guess, kind of why I liked it because it just shows. I guess I guess it kind of goes into something I liked about this movie existing as an Ethan Cohen experience only because him doing that and showing how unhinged he can be shows how different he is from his brother. So if anyways, I, I, I kind of like it as as maybe this like meta form of storytelling, uh, like of what he's able to get away with without that methodical mm -hmm. control that his brother's able to bring to their films usually. Uh, so maybe I like it less in context of how it functions as a story and more so how it functions as a, what can a filmmaker get away with and deliberately try to piss audiences off. Like, I, I, Which I don't think he's good at. That's what his brother is good at. And I, I think don't think he's good at it either. Falls apart at it seems. Sure. It's arguing against its own, its own ethos, which I don't think works here at all. But when it indulges in those things, it adds value. There's a lot of fun to be had here. It's really great. It's this loose romp comedy that you either love or you don't. That's where this film thrives. When it tries to tap into his brother's ethos, such as that moment we're arguing about, that's where mm -hmm. the film really falls apart because he's trying to be someone he's not. That's mm -hmm. where if they were doing this together, I think Joel would be like, okay, let me handle the nihilism and cynicism. You're not good at it. I am. And I do think that would have ended in a very different way. And maybe I would be more on your side if I did have the same feelings towards these two goons like you do. Uh, but because I was already so passive with them as characters due to their respective performances, having it end and crystallize that way kind of left me amused. It's sort of the opposite of something like, and I'm going to give a spoiler here for Burn After Reading, uh, what happens to the Brad Pitt character in that movie, okay? I love that character. He is my favorite thing in Burn After Reading, so when that thing happens to him, 
it turns into one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Uh, it, like, and and that's I guess kind of similar to how you're feeling about what happens to these two goons. Like, well, like, and like it had nothing to do with whether they're likable or not. Like, I it's didn't. Not, well, really I'm not talking about. about I'm, I'm not talking about specifics of likability. I'm just talking about how you can positively positively receive a character, just in the general sense. Uh, it doesn't matter if you like but them. I'm, that's not with what them. I'm talking about either. I'm talking about thematic structure. I'm talking about writing a character in this case, two characters in a certain way that taps into the core of what the movie is trying to be. And then when you go to crystallize those two characters, same thing happens to Brad Pitt against your nucleus. Same thing happens to Brad Pitt. He has a thematic arc in that movie and it just ends for no apparent reason. Yeah. Like to to me, it didn't matter whether I liked them or not. And well, well, I, I certainly didn't have any sort of strong feelings one way or another. To me, it has nothing to do with the performances or the mm-hmm. characters themselves. Honestly, mm-hmm. I don't really care. What what I found intriguing about them, again, is what Ethan is bringing to them in terms of that slick subversion. That, sure. to me, is what's interesting, not the characters themselves, if that makes sense. It does make and sense. And I think in the crystallization of them t- of the two, again, I don't care about the characters and, and my, my, my subjective feelings about them. It has everything to do with how Ethan is undermining his own nucleus, that he, mm-hmm. his own thematic structure. Mm-hmm. It's it's like he's pulling the rug out for nothing. If he was doing that f- to add value or purpose, then that's fine. I'm mm-hmm. okay with that. And that's how I feel about Burn After Reading, which is where you and I will disagree there. That I movie do does the same it, thing this movie does with that character. It's the exact same okay. thing. Okay, I I think there's more value to that than what it is here. That just sounds like here, such a contradictory here statement to me. Here is just this convenient thing where we have to get these girls out of this situation, and that's you're all describing that burn after is. reading as well. I I think it's a little <laughs> bit more than that. Here it feels fleeting and adds no value. But everything leading up to that point with those two characters, I think, is really great because of what Ethan Cohen brings to this type of movie is very I'll just, different. I'll, I'll just say I like the idea of it. I don't like the presentation of it. Uh, it just goes back to that same point. Uh, and and I I guess I don't. Know, it's just hard to explain. Like the way it Chris the the, uh, the amusement I had with the way it crystallized was maybe it just had to do with my lack of care for those characters. And and not 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 in a sympathy level. It's like if if you want me to find an engaging interest in what a movie is at least attempting to do. I need to be at least amused or at least interested interested to see what those subjects are going to do. Uh, okay. And and that's what I just didn't get from those characters. Okay. Now, I, mean, I got I, it from everyone I else I have here. no problem separating the two. I feel like I do this all the time. Like, I, I mean, I don't even know. I can bring up a thousand different examples where I mm-hmm. don't love a film, but I can separate and admire, like Maestro. I can use that as an example. I don't mm-hmm. love that movie. But I do admire a lot of elements about, like I can separate my subjective feelings about it and look at, yeah, the thematic structure of the film or his performance or whatever it is, and have a conversation about that separately than my own subjective feelings. Well, that's what I'm talking about here. I'm I'm not conflating the two. Well. Okay, then these two characters. Not trying to. No, no, you're fine. You're fine, and I do the same thing and trying to find ways to appreciate things, even if I don't like the film as a whole. But sometimes there's a certain level of appreciation that can take you so far before you realize, okay, but I can't defend this anymore, and and, and that's where it got to that point with these two characters for me. Uh, and and I guess if I I hate using this word, like I just I do because it's it's a word I never like to use when describing movies. There always has to be a why. When you talk about something like this, why you felt this way, the simple matter is these two goons, I think, are boring. I just think they're very boring. Uh, And and, and I I can appreciate the idea of what they're trying to represent. But if if your subjects are boring me with that idea, then you're not going to sell the point to me. Like, Mm -hmm. at least with Maestro, I agree that movie falls apart in many ways, but it didn't necessarily bore me. Like, it didn't completely disconnect me in that way. These two goons completely disconnected me from the movie. Uh, And so I wasn't able to latch on to that appreciation that I know what Ethan Cohen is trying to do. And I respect that. I do. I, I, it's, it's, it's all about that presentation for me. Okay. And look, I didn't, 
intend for us to spend a lot of time. Neither did I. Because <laughs> there is a lot to discuss still with Jamie and Marion. However, yeah. I did want to emphasize at least where I'm coming from because yeah, that's fair. How I feel about it on the whole, a lot of it comes down to those two characters and that okay. structure that Ethan Cohen brings to it because mm-hmm. they're in this film quite a bit. They you are. might be bored by them, but they're in this film, like what? 30% of the time they're Yeah. They're, they're kind in of this the, film a lot. Kind of, and that might by, be on by, the by, low end. Of, by, ca- by character ranking, they're kind of third and fourth underneath our two leads in some ways. Honestly. Yes. They're on screen more than Coleman Domingo. And they're on screen more, more than a lot of these other cameos. Here. They're on screen more than Beanie Feldstein, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, absolutely. They're on screen on screen quite a bit. Yeah. So if they don't work for you, I understand. Yeah. But because they have such um a, a, such of a big impact on the plotting of the film and the the overall scheme of it all, mm-hmm. that I did want to emphasize why those two characters did bring something because if without defending that, I'm not able to articulate why yeah. I enjoyed this well, what, film. Why the, the overarching movie still works. Yeah, yes. I get it. If I get all it. we talked about was Jamie and Marion, and I do want to talk about them. Mm-hmm. That's only half of it for me. It, I, it, it literally I, is I half the movie. I truly enjoyed the goon characters because the dialogue they are given here is something you simply don't see in these movies. And mm-hmm. I really liked that a lot. Even if the execution isn't all there to Brendan's point, and it might not be, the mm-hmm. presentation could be lacking a little bit. But on the whole, I appreciate the attempt. And I mm-hmm. think it works more than it doesn't, minus the crystallization, as we argued about. Mm-hmm. And that does matter here. For me, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that does matter. Because that's, that's what that's makes fair. this a Cohen movie. Yeah, the that's Jamie fair. and Marion of it all alone doesn't make this a Cohen movie for me. But they mm-hmm. do. They, alongside Jamie and Marion make this half of a Cohen movie. And without it, I, I I think this film suffers quite a lot more than it already does without Joan's, uh, you know, his, the precision he would have brought to this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's very fair. Uh, there is a cal- I don't know if that's the right word, but by comparison, a calming nature to when we focus strictly on Jamie and Marion and their relationship and how that sort of contrasts everything. Well, it, it's, it, and it's in their relationship, the two of them specifically that I could really feel like Ethan and Trisha were talking to each other when making this movie. Like mm-hmm. uh, I, 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 like they're, they are definitely the closest to being some type of cipher for their marriage. And maybe that's why I was latching onto them more because of that meta component. But I think really it just comes down to those two performances. Uh, And as we talked about, their chemistry on screen is wonderful. And it's not even just the, uh, the quieter moments that I alluded to earlier, such as a basement makeout session that they talk about at one point, not even talk about, they partake in at one point Uh, or even some of the, some of the, some of the quieter moments that they have in the car or in the hotel room. It's it's in the quirkier moments when they actually discover what's in the trunk <laughs> and what's mm-hmm. in the hat box. I'll simply say, uh, somehow they're able to sell things that I don't think in it. I don't think an unexperienced actor would be able to sell. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it would it would come off way too heightened and way too manic for its own good. And sometimes this movie does. In fact, a lot of times this movie does. But when you have two actors that know how to leverage that, it, it's it, it's it's quite touching yeah. at times. I think. No, I, I loved it. I, I thought their dynamic throughout the film was really great. I think the ciphering of it through Henry James is oh, a yeah. nice little way to bring some, like a specific lens to these characters, in particular yeah. Marion, because she's the one that is reading Henry James throughout a lot of this film. But mm-hmm. We also get like some flashbacks to her as a child as well. Uh, yeah, where she's yeah. coming into her own a little bit. So you, you do kind of come to understand, especially through the performance, that she's looking for something very specific. Mm-hmm. She's absolutely not the free spirit that Jamie is. And I love that in Margaret Qualley's performance with sure. her thick, heavy Texas accent <laughs> that yeah. she's trying yeah. to pull off here. I don't know if she is wholly convincing, but it's fun nonetheless. Oh, like the fact that it's and, not convincing is actually why I like it. Which is fair. I, <laughs> that's my argument for almost all of this film is that 
it doesn't work, and that's part of the charm. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, at least part of at least I it don't. makes me at least it made me laugh. It had a personality yeah. to it. I, I do like. I mean, because again, this is a film that isn't aiming for some sort of artistic threshold. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's goofy, it's rompy. It's very, uh, it's a lunacy is all over the place. Mm-hmm. So when a, f- when a performance or a certain aspect only reaches like half of a threshold that, of yep. what you're expecting, it almost feels intentional. I don't know if it yeah. is or not, but it certainly comes off that way at times. It does. It very much does. Yeah. And, uh, but I love that dynamic between Jamie and Marion. It's a great dichotomy, you know, classic in many ways. Uh, but something that this film utilizes to its advantage. I love that Marion hasn't had sex in what three years. She says mm-hmm. the film opens with Jamie having sex. So like she's, we're very mm-hmm. much in it with her from the beginning, but how those two characters bond and have this shared experience that gets quite intimate even by the end, I think yeah. is really great. There's certainly a lot of fun to be had when the caper takes control of the movie, but even when it's just about their identities and how they become entangled here. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, well, I think it's really great. It, it, yeah. You know, it's again, it's not trying to be anything grand, but there is something very endearing about the execution of it. Well, yeah. And even when the caper sort of takes over in the back half of the movie, like the, the plot kicks in, there's still a complementary nature to how it fits in with their relationship. Uh, and and yeah. it, what, it, without getting into spoilers, uh, this is not like Pulp Fiction. We actually find out what's in the suitcase. And I'm not yeah. going to say what it is, um, but I like what's in there uh, because it's something that is literally kind of testing their orientation a little bit. Uh, and, and I, so I like that idea. It sort of goes back to what we talked about earlier regarding Ethan and Trisha's own marriage and how different that it is. It's kind of beyond labels in some ways. So what's actually in that suitcase sort of tests the labeling that we usually see with romance nowadays. Uh, and, and I like that about it. And sort of the, um, I guess, underlying political side of it as well. It's, <laughs> it's, it, what's in there represents uh, uh, something from people who will literally screw you over. So now let's take that thing and screw each yeah. other over with it. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's, and then we'll screw those same people back over. It's, I, I, I like those ideas. If there's any actual interesting insight this movie is presenting it's simply based on what's in that suitcase no, uh, it's it, it's hilarious yeah, now, yeah i love that it's interesting you and i have a little bit of a different read on that shall okay we, based on how this conversation hey is that gone. makes it an interesting movie i guess i certainly did not get anything in terms of what's in the suitcase how that tests their orientation you and i well very different in that regard. Well, I, so I did not get anything of that sort here. I would say it adds a curiosity, if anything. Okay. I That's not how I feel. I would disagree okay. with that. Okay. But I do think what it does, though, is it adds a level of intimacy to the two characters mm-hmm. that takes their relationship to a different level for sure. But where I do agree with you in terms of the relationship between Jamie and Marion, mm-hmm. how that evolves especially regarding this idea of a politician and how he could be, shall we say, um, screwed over, as you put it. (laughs) And and the symbolic fortitude of that and the irony, of course, that he's being screwed over in that specific way as politicians tend to do with their own citizens. I do Mm -hmm. think that is absolutely what uh, Cook and Cohen are going for. Yeah, that's the more obvious side of it, I think. Uh, But even so, yeah, it's very on the nose. It's not a movie that's trying to hide that, but I at least... I I at least appreciate that for committed. I laughed at that quite they're, They're certainly committed to that bit, and they obviously feel passionate about communicating that thematic bit to us. So I, I at least give them, you know, credit for their, uh, their, their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Their, uh, their, their, their deliberate nature there and just how yeah. obvious that it is. And, and to emphasize that obviousness even more, 
I, because to Brennan's point, we, we don't have to give away what is in the suitcase. Yeah. However, we do know that what is in the suitcase comes from a woman named Tiffany Plaster Caster. <laughs> and yeah. And when you, when you see what is in the suitcase, that name will make a lot of sense. And it will make a lot of sense. Very funny. And the actress that plays Tiffany Plasticaster here is a huge surprise that I did not know at I, all. I feel like that's the cameo people are talking about that's going to take people by surprise because this actress is very top of mind now, I'll simply say. Um, she is, she's got a few recent awards, I'll simply say, and not in the film world. I'll just leave yeah. it at that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's definitely someone you know. Yeah, it's definitely someone you know. It's really funny. Again, there's this psychedelic angle to it. And when you consider how she got these things, it adds a whole other <laughs> layer to it that I think is yeah. really funny. Yeah. And then, you know, it crystallizes with everything we see at the end there with Matt Damon, as we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just I think that's all hilarious. Like yeah. I, again, very loose. It's extremely goofy, but it's tackled with I think a little bit more deafness than an, uh, other filmmakers that I think could just simply get bogged down in the the lunacy of it all or mm-hmm. you know or or just trying to keep studio executives happy and doing it in this very matter of fact kind of way sure like we get from a lot of studio comedies or you know over the last 10 15 years especially mm-hmm. this still feels like it still feels coheny to me i, I well, think that, that's, well, that's why dumping thing. this in february I kind of understand. <laughs> well, that's the thing. This movie does feel like it's trying too hard, but at the same time, it has a conviction that some other movies that try too hard don't have. Uh, and maybe it's because we can at least still recognize the the Cohen like nature of this movie. Like, 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 even though this wasn't directed by the Cohen brothers, it certainly has more of a Cohen identity. Then let's say when George Clooney tried to direct Suburbicon, which was ironically co-written by the Coen brothers, right? Yeah. Uh, Like that is a movie that reeked of trying too hard and also trying to be a Coen brothers movie. Yes. This is not that. It's certainly, it's unhinged in the same way, but at least has a distinct personality that earns, well, I say at least more so earns that unhinged nature because it at least raises conversations that are more interesting to talk about. I agree. I agree. And yeah, even though I, I I'm think, mixed on the movie, I like that it exists in this way. I I agree. Like I I had a lot of fun with it. I mean, as far as these goofy lesser Cohen Brothers films go, I probably like it more than what I have at the bottom four. I like I, mm. I think I'm yeah, I'd it's, say I, I, I'm that high on it. It's probably still bottom three for me. I mean I I admittedly need to rewatch Intolerable Cruelty again. It's been quite a while. Mm -hmm. I certainly like this more than The Lady Killers. I would definitely take this over Burn After Reading. Uh, Where we might differ is I'll still take the Hudsucker Proxy over this. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's like, I just, I love the craft of that movie. Uh, It's, that's, it's, it's not a great movie, but I think the craft of it is just too good to ignore. Uh, Whereas... I, 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 but I do think this movie raises more of an interesting conversation if that gives it any justification in some ways. So it's, I guess it really just depends on what I'm looking for. It might, might change my feelings on how I rank these things. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would definitely take it over those four. Okay. Although I would need to watch burn after reading again. I still might prefer that to this. Mm. I don't know. Well, I mean, well, as much I'm as I don't sure. like that movie, it is still a tighter movie. Yeah. And yeah, there's something about it that's still really fun for me. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to watch it again, though, but I might take this. So I would definitely take it over the other three for sure. Gotcha. Okay. Although, to your point, Intolerable Cruelty is one that I haven't seen in a long time as well. Yeah. 
And that's well, another I, one that I, I feel like is sort of finding an audience as time goes yeah. on. I, 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 these lesser Coen Brothers films, they're starting to find more of an mm -hmm. audience, whether I think they need to or not. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I think Intolerable Cruelty is probably the one that's going to be most accepted as the underrated Coen Brothers film as time goes on. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say this, though. The Lady, Kid the Lady Killers, you will not find me amongst that audience i, I can't defend that one there no i can't i can't defend that one this last week i watched hud sucker proxy as promised mm -hmm. i think i like it lesser than i did before i, I rewatched it as well worse than i remembered i rewatched it as well i think i'm about the same on it i i i, I certainly like it more than you but i can't I, i'm not gonna bend over backwards to say this has to be in the I top just, 10 coen I brothers can't. film i just no way I, the I movie just, looks amazing, it. though. It is such I an just, aesthetic treat. Uh, like I, not, I'd say, it's it's not for me, not for me. Not even top five best looking Coen Brothers films, if you ask me. I think it's mm -hmm. almost in that conversation. Mm -mm. We the have problem is the writing. Aesthetic palettes, because that film is ugly. Do you even know what good looking movies look like, JD? That's <laughs> a great looking movie. It's not. Okay, it really I, is. that might be a little facetious, but it's definitely not top five. <laughs> I don't think it looks that great, but it's also one of those where. I think everything in that film is exhausting, absolutely exhausting. It, but uh, that I, may, I don't that I don't necessarily disagree with. I think the farcical nature of that movie didn't really warrant a two hour runtime. I do think it wears itself out. Uh, if anything, it's also the Tim Robbins of it all. I'm not sure if he's the right guy to sell that energy. Um, but Jennifer Jason Lee, I think, is amazing in that. She's movie. great. No, yeah. she's she's really great. Yeah, and uh, as just, well as Paul just, Newman. Just running down the list here. Mm -hmm. films and i'm just doing this off the cuff yeah. films that i would take aesthetically over hudsucker and i'm just looking at my personal list here lewin mm -hmm. davis hands down that might be number one yes fargo absolutely no country absolutely oh brother absolutely true grit no question mm -hmm. serious man yes hell caesar especially ballad of buster scruggs big time mm -hmm. maybe miller's crossing after that, it's debatable. But that's where I'm at. Like, that's how far down the list I would say Hudsucker Proxy is, even on an aesthetic I'm, level. I'm, I'm looking at my list here. I think it's, okay, so Fargo, Davis, Brother, No Country, definitely like those movies aesthetically more. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of movies I prefer aesthetically, but I'd certainly take Hudsucker over Blood Simple, Big Lebowski, Raising Arizona, Man Who Wasn't There, Lady Killers, Burn After Reading, Elements of Buster Scruggs, because Buster Scruggs does have a bit of a digital sheen to it that doesn't always work for me. Uh, but I do like the the painterly nature of it overall from a color standpoint. Um, but yeah, like, I still think the uh, the Hudsucker Proxy just looks so interesting that I have to defend it in some way. Okay. Yeah. That's just me. Two weeks That's just own. me. We have different aesthetic palettes, too. That's perfectly hey, fine. Don't you love when the Coens make movies that yeah. no one agrees on? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look, I was being a little facetious. Oh, so was I. So was I. Comment yeah. But yeah. I, I, th I do think it is lesser Cohen's, even aesthetically speaking. Yeah. I but I, I that but far, beyond but, yeah. that, that's not the issue of that film, though. Yeah. Not even close. It's it's the writing. It's the writing. Yeah. And anyway, we've we've detoured quite a bit from Drive Away Dolls. So, do you have any <laughs> final thoughts on that before we wind down here? Um, I will just say I love seeing that both Ethan and Trisha love. Funkadelic's maggot brain as much as I do because those psychedelic sequences utilizing that song not once but twice made me giddy. So I I, I love that. I love that. I'll just simply get my music nerd side uh, represented here. Uh, but I, th I okay. thought that was at least a nice touch. All right. Yeah, I just want to emphasize again Margaret Qualley and Geraldine Viss Swanathan because yeah. they They're great. are really great here. They're really funny. Uh, they do a great job of playing up that whole free spirited versus uptight and rigid dynamic that's at play between those two characters and do such a great job of letting that unfold in this natural, interesting way mm -hmm. uh, where they, you know, find a little bit of int intimacy by the end yeah. and, and while still maintaining that humor. Now, but there are a couple of moments where the camera lingers on them allowing their performances to tap into something that's beyond the lunacy, mm -hmm. such as the moment where we get that moment on Marion yeah. where she's in the basement and 
the team is making out with each other. Yeah. And it's so she like has this epiphany that isn't there on the page. It is wholly in Viswanathan's performance, which I think is really great. Sure. You know, or I think about Margaret Qualley and some of the scenes she has in the back half of this film when she's just looking at Marion at times in this earnest way, like for someone that has this free spirited, I just want to have sex with anything that can move at Mm -hmm. times kind of vibe. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She looks at Marion with these earnest eyes that I think are just fantastic. I, yeah, and, for sure, for sure. Uh, and so, yeah, I just, I, I love those performances here. They're really great, really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I liked it. I liked it on the whole. I, I don't know what else to say. It's it's an insane movie. It's ridiculous, yeah. wholly absurd, but it's cohen enough mm-hmm. that I enjoyed it. I, I did. It's okay. as disjointed and as too loose as it is at times. But I will say, I would love to see them get back together next, and it sounds like they are. It sounds like they are. For Which a horror great. movie, I think. Wait, that doesn't surprise me. They Yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. They've been ready for a horror in some in some time, I think. So eh, and some of their movies have had elements of horror. That's so, what I mean. Yeah. They've yeah, yeah. they've been building to this. So Oh yeah. Yeah. Bring it on. Um all right. Well, with that, those are our thoughts on drive away dolls. Uh, if you agree or disagree with anything we had to say here, you can leave a comment below. If you're watching on YouTube, reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can always email us in sessionfilm at gmail.com as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we would love to hear from you. Um, you can also or be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you're watching mm-hmm. on YouTube, subscribe, like the video, uh, all that fun stuff. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please write and review us there. It really helps out the show. Yep. And I think that is it. Any final yeah. thoughts on anything before we get out of here? I think after that conversation, JD, we should be renamed the goons. Yeah, the goon squad. <laughs> the goon squad. <laughs> the incession film goon, goon squad. squad. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a new segment if there ever was one. Absolutely. Uh, I look forward to, because we haven't done this exercise yet, we're actually yeah. going to do that next. Yeah. Episode 574. We're going to revisit our Cohen rankings from last week. And talk about where these two solo films sit. Yeah. Based off this conversation, it, you know, I, I anticipated that segment lasting about 10, 15 minutes after this debate. Who knows? Probably more like it 30 or 40. The whole show now. So, uh, looking forward to seeing how that goes, though. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the In Session Film Podcast. Oh, wow. The Coens are always fun to talk about. Absolutely. Listen to Maggot Brain, people. Great album. Great song.